So how many of you have studied, been in a Bible study, and studied the Gospel of John before? Okay, Gospel of John before, okay. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple questions, just blurt it out, uh, because I want to just get you going. This is going to be an introduction uh, before we actually dig in, dig in, even though we're going to um, study some of the scripture uh, today. But uh, I want you, here's a very, very hard question. Uh, who's the author of John? <laughs> Nobody's saying anything. Okay. <laughs> you guys all laughing. You're like, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's John. Okay. Like, what was the old thing my dad used to say? Who's in Grant's tomb? Remember that old thing? My dad, who's in Grant's tomb? And we all be like little kids, like, mm, like oh, Grant. <laughs> like, okay, dad. So, John, through being carried by the Holy Spirit, right, authored the book of John. Okay, how many know about what time it was written? Like, what years it was written during? Any idea? It was written between like 90 and 100 A.D., okay? Uh, A.D. means anno domino. It does not mean after death. Just so you know, it means anno domini, right? The year of our Lord. B.C. means before Christ. And that came through Christianity. A.D. and B.C. came through Christianity. Uh, since then, many people use C.E., which is common era, and B.C.E., which is before Common Era, because they don't want to have it, like, they, they want to make non-Christians feel comfortable. So it's A.D., it's A.D., and it's B.C. My B.C. that I always tell people, my B.C. is before Christ, right? Before I came to know Christ. I'm like, oh, that was B.C., before Christ in my life. How many of you know how many chapters there are? Excellent. 21. Michelle, more candy for this lady in the green. In the green. 21. That's right. 21 chapters. And you're all going, Margo, we went through Ephesians last year. How are you going to possibly make it through there? We'll be fine. We'll be fine. Right right there. See? I told you there's, there's candy. All right. Does anyone know John's nickname? He had a little bit of a temper at times. Sons of Thunder, yes. His brother was James, and James and John were known as Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder, okay? Because he was known to be a little hot-headed at times. Uh, and then who knows where John was exiled to? Patmos, to the Isle of Patmos. Excellent. The Romans put him there because of why? Because of his faith because of his faith, okay? And if you remember, John was identified as the disciple whom, yeah, don't you want to be known as that? Huh? Yeah, I know, the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? Absolutely, but I mean, he was, he was called out as that. You know, all the other disciples, they weren't called out as that, but he was called out as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And just imagine that. John is like writing that down. Like, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. Right? That sounds sort of like braggadocious, doesn't it? But it's not. It's not because he, he drew close to him. And what happens when you draw close to him? He draws close to you. Remember? And then uh, what other books of the Bible did John write? Do you know? He wrote John, obviously. Revelation. There's only Sean, no S on it. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then what? First, second, and third John. Those are the only ones that he wrote. John, the epistles of first, second, and third John, and Revelation. Okay, so I just wanted to see where you are with John in this and ask you some questions on that because, quite frankly, we are sitting, right now, we are sitting at the feet of the last living disciple of Jesus Christ. The last living disciple of Jesus Christ is John. And John had been telling his stories and had been preaching for more than 60 years. And now he writes it down. And now he writes it down. And so everything that John writes down is about to help the followers 
of Jesus to grow up in their faith, to grow up in God's grace. And that's why he wrote it. See, the words in John are very, very simple to understand. They're very simple to understand. But the meaning is very deep. In fact, John is the most profound gospel. It's not a part of the synoptic gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synoptic just means that they're taking a common view. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're taking a common view. They're similar in context. Uh, they're similar in order. They're similar in the stories and in the statement. But John is not a part of the synoptic gospels. In fact, when we are in chapters 1 through 12, we're going to spend a lot of time with Jesus. We're going to spend a lot of time walking with Jesus through his first three years of ministry. Just put yourself there, that we'll be walking and talking with him for, through the first 12 chapters of how of how he was sharing and who he was as all God and all man during his first three years of ministry. And then the last chapters, 13 through 21, we're going to follow him on just the last three weeks of him on earth. 13 through 21 cover just the last three weeks of him on earth. And so... The Gospel of John gives us uh, more about the resurrected Christ, the resurrected Christ, than any other Gospel writer. More than Matthew, Mark, and Luke put together. Because why? Because John walked with Jesus. Because John talked with Jesus after the cross. After the cross. And he never, ever, ever forgot it. Would you forget it? I wouldn't forget it, right? After, after Jesus was resurrected, he walked and talked with him, and he never, ever forgot it. So when I was studying this, a lot of times I heard some uh, theologians say that John, the Gospel of John is like a simple gospel. It's just a simple gospel, right? Like it's written in monosyllabic, that means one syllable, and disyllabic, that means two-syllable, words. So it's like really simple. They're like, oh, it's such a simple gospel. Let me illustrate by this verse in John 1, 11 and 12. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Every single word in there was either one syllable or two syllables. Very simple, but very deep. But very deep. Take the expression uh, out of John 14, verse 20, which says, You and me, and I and you. Jesus is talking. You and me, and I and you. Okay? Those are seven words. You and me, and I and you. And if you know me, I am a wordsmith. I am a word nerd, okay? And so let me tell you, when, when he says seven words, one is a conjunction. Who knows what a conjunction is? Okay. It, it connects. It connect, they're connectors between words. So the conjun, conjunction is and, okay? So when he says you and me, and I and you, the conjunction is what? And, it's and, okay? It's and. Then it has two prepositions. What does that mean? Prep you guys are so cute. Oh, don't call on me. <laughs> two prepositions, right? Those are modifiers of nouns or verbs or adjectives. And so when you look at that, you and me and I and you, right, the word is what? In. Very good. It's, it's in. Okay? So you've got... Seven words. One's a conjunction and two are prepositions in. And then there are four pronouns. What's a pronoun? It's like a replacement for a noun, right? Replacement for a noun. 
And so the four pronouns are you, me, I, you. Okay, you, me, I, and you. He says, you and me, and I and you. Now you just got a little bit of grammar lesson there too. How great is that, right? Okay, so you've got seven words, seven words, and you could take any of the words, you and me and I and you, and put it before a fourth grader, and they would know the meaning of each of those words. They would know the meaning of each of those words, and they could give you a definition of each of those words, not necessarily, you know, the conjunction, prepositions, and pronoun, but they'd be able to tell you what these words mean. Okay, so you put them together, you and me, and I and you, okay, and neither the most profound theological, or I should say theologian, profound theologian, nor the greatest philosopher has ever, ever been able to probe the depths of their meaning. You and me, and I and you. Now, we know that you and me means salvation, right? Jesus in me, right, that you've accepted Jesus, you've come to know him personally, you've accepted that he died on the cross for your sin, not just for the whole world, right, where we have John 3, 16, which is the most popular known verse in all of the world, but he died for you. Like, I didn't come to know him until I was 31 years old when I realized that I couldn't live off my mom's faith, that he actually died for me, that I was the big stinking sinner that he died for. And I was so, so glad that he did. And so, and so then, upon believing that he died for me, then, and forgives my sin, past, present, and future, then he comes to live in me by the Holy Spirit. So it's you in me. We know, we know that that means salvation. And I in you means sanctification. And sanctification is just a big, long word for becoming more and more like Jesus and less like our Putrid selves, that's right. That's sanctification. We're becoming more and more and more like Jesus, right? Like if you look back, say last year, say five years, say 10 years, you're not who you used to be. You're becoming more and more like him, right? You're being conformed to the likeness of his son. It's way easier for you to do the next right thing, the next right thing, the next right thing, right? Way easier than it used to be. There's not that going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right? Sanctification. You're becoming more and more like Jesus until we see him face to face, and it will never stop. We're never going to be perfected until we see him face to face. So, the words are simple in John. The words are simple, but the meaning is deep. The meaning is deep. So, so why, why did John write this gospel then? Why did he? Well, it was the last one written around, around 90 to 100 AD. All the apostles were dead. And the writers of the New Testament were gone. And he alone was left. And so John wrote at the request of the church, of the church, which already had the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, okay? And they were being circulated, but they wanted something more spiritual. They wanted something more deep. They wanted something that would enable them to grow up in Jesus. In other words, to become faithful so that their faith would grow up. And so when we come to the gospel of John, he doesn't, he doesn't take us to Bethlehem like Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. He doesn't take us like the nativity story. All of those others do, okay? Because you're never going to grow spiritually just by singing a little town of Bethlehem a million times, okay? That's not going to happen, okay, at Christmas, okay? See, John won't take us to Bethlehem because he wants us to grow up as believers, he wants us to grow up as believers. And so he's writing to us to become faithful. And so what he does instead is John takes us down the silent corridors of eternity. You good, Barb? You good? All right. 
He takes us down the silent corridors of eternity, past eternity, like through the emptiness of the vast space to a beginning that really isn't a beginning at all. Because John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay, so when you read in the beginning, you go back as far as your little pea brain can go, right? My little pea brain can go, and you go into eternity past, and you put down your stake, and Jesus Christ comes out of eternity to meet you, right? That's what he does, because he's always going after you. So he talks about how God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were together forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, ever in the past, eternity, right? In this perfect love relationship. Until in God's fullness of time, which we're going to learn at retreat, which is Kairos time, fullness of time, Jesus comes, right, out of eternity and steps into time to become a man so he could die because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin for you and me. So he doesn't take us to Bethlehem. He goes way, way deeper. He takes us to the eternity past, the silent corridors, right? And when you read in the beginning, in the beginning, right, eternity past, just put your stake down then and say, this is it. And this is when Jesus Christ comes out of eternity and meets you and meets me personally. In the beginning was, remember, it's not is. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1, 3 says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. All things were made by him, and without him not anything made that was made. And then John, if you jump down to the 14th verse, he takes another step and he says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, the Word. In verse 18, he says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is, the bosom, which is in the bosom of the Father, and he has declared him. And he has declared him. That declared him means that he exegeted him, right? He led him out into the open. He led him out into the open where man can see him. Right? If he didn't come after us, we would never know him. God's the one that made a way that we could have a relationship with him. And if he wouldn't have done that and brought Jesus out into the open where you and I can see him and come to know him, we'd be lost. We'd be lost. So think about this. The man who had no origin is the son of God who comes out of eternity. The man who had no origin is the son of God who comes out of eternity. Eternity. So when you read the Gospel of John, it really is for those who believe. It's really, I know that many people go John 3 and read about Nicodemus and his salvation. Absolutely, he brings that in. But the majority of it is for those who already believe. So when you come to the chapters of chapter 13 through 17. You can basically write a sign over it that says, for believers only. Because it's made for you and I as believers, you and me. Because what does he do there? Because Jesus took his own into the upper room. Into the upper room and revealed to them things that enabled them to grow up in their faith. And no other gospel writer gives us that. No other gospel writer gives us that. And why is it? Well, because they were the evangelists who are presenting Christ as the Savior of the world. 
right? And that's who he is, correct? And that's what they were doing. They were presenting Christ as the Savior of the world. But then you can ask, well, doesn't John do that? Well, yes, he does, okay? But he's primarily writing to you and me for the growth of believers. He wants us to grow up. He wants us to grow up in our faith. And so that's why he's writing. Because John gives us more about the resurrected Christ than does any gospel writer. In fact, all of them put together, as I mentioned before. Like Paul said, Paul said, though we have known Christ after the flesh, we don't know him that way anymore. And, and rather, we know him how? We know him as the resurrected Christ, right? He didn't stay on that cross, praise God. He's resurrected. He's the living Jesus Christ, who was, who is, who evermore will be. He's living. He's the living Christ, right? And so, and so he's writing to us as believers about the resurrected Christ. And so for this reason, John attempts to give appearances. You will see as we go through the Gospel of John. He's giving appearances of Jesus after his resurrection, and he specifically uh, gives us seven. He gives us seven of them. Uh, I'm just going to highlight them quickly because we're going to dig in and we're going to study that as we go along in John. But the first was the most dramatic is what? He appeared to what? Mary Magdalene, remember? In the garden, right? After he's resurrected. And the second one is when he appeared to the disciples in the upper room. And if you remember, Thomas was absent during that time. So... His third appearance was again to the disciples in the upper room with Thomas present, right? Okay, and so he made sure that he made sure that Thomas was there as well. And then we see him um, appearing by the Sea of Galilee. This is after his resurrection. And remember, several disciples were out fishing, and he called to them from the shore, Do you have any fish? Remember? Did they have any? No, right? That's in John 21, right? And then do you remember he prepared breakfast for them? He prepared breakfast for them. You guys, wouldn't you have loved to have been there, that outdoor breakfast? Jesus is like, you know, you're coming in and he, there's Jesus preparing breakfast. Really? How great would that be? Can you imagine? That fish must have been perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. I mean, that is a real cookout. I mean, he didn't burn anything. He made sure it was done right. I mean, oh, it had to be just perfect, right? And, and quite frankly, ladies, he still wants to feed you in the morning. He still wants to feed you in the morning. He also wants to feed you during the day. And he also wants to feed you in the evening. He wants you to have that non-negotiable face-to-face time with him. Day after day after day after day. Because he loves you. Because he loves you. And he wants your faith to grow up. And he wants you to respond in love. And then if you remember, he commissioned Simon Peter. And he said, Simon, do you love me? Remember that? That's in John 21 as well. He said, Simon, do you love me? Notice he didn't say to Peter, uh, did you, like, make everything right? And have you been a graduate of the seminary and everything? Uh, because I, I want you to come and serve me now. He didn't do that. That's not who he is. He just asked, do you love me? Do you love me? That's what he asked us. That's the one condition to be his disciple to serve him every day, every way. Grocery stores, banks, driving, here, friends, neighbors. Do you love me? That's all he wants to know. That's all he wants to know. See, when, when you love him, you'll want to be training like for the calling that he has for you. But, but he wants to know that you love him. That you love him first of all. I mean, John, 
called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. Because you know why? Because he loved Jesus. He loved him. I mean, he was there at the cross. He was there. He loved him. He was his life. Remember how we learned Christ, who is our life. It's not that he just gives us life. He is our life. And I believe the reason that many aren't serving him today is that they don't really love him. They look at rules. They look at, you know, checking off this, 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 or I got to be this way or this, this. He just wants to know if you love him. Because he says, if you love me, you'll what? You'll obey me. If you love me, you'll obey me. Really easy to do that. When you love somebody, it's really easy to obey him. He wants to know that you love him. And then just think about after he asked him, Peter, do you love me? Then Peter was told that he was going to be a martyr. He was going to be a martyr. But John, no. John was going to live on in order to write this gospel and the three epistles and the book of Revelation. See, we need to keep staying in our lane. Right? You just stay in our lane. What he has for us. How he loves you. And how you love him and what your calling is with him. I mean, when you think about that, Matthew and Mark Talk about the miracles of Jesus. I mean, if you want to read the incredible miracles of Jesus, read Matthew and Mark, right? And then Luke is big time into parables, right? That's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? And meanwhile, John doesn't do either of those things. He doesn't do either of those things. The, the miracles in John are given as signs, as signs. They're given, at, like, they were chosen... The miracles were chosen with great discrimination in order to interpret certain truths that he wanted to get across. For instance, the discourse, the discourse on the bread of life, the discourse just means it's a, that's a formal discussion, either writing or orally. That's what a discourse means. And, and when John did the discourse on the bread of life, uh, it followed the feeding of the 5,000. Are you following me? I mean, that's purposeful. That is, that is purposeful. And that the fact that there's no parables in this fourth gospel, right, um, is that it, it, it's like he talks about the good shepherd. It's not really a parable. It's another discourse. And John, as we go through it, you will see how he gives this, this chronological order. It's like, it's like you'll, you'll be able to, like it's chronos time, okay? And so you'll be able to follow along. It's like a ladder on which you can like fit the three-year ministry of Jesus Christ onto. Like he talks about like the next day or the next day or the next day or where he was. In other words, he did time and location all the time. So you're able to follow that. And the other thing that is very, very typical in John is that he emphasizes the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus equals God, the deity of Jesus Christ, okay? And that's actually in the foreground over and over and over again, okay? But the humanity of Jesus Christ is not lost sight of. It's just that John basically tells that story. He's the only one that tells the story about his trip through Samaria, Jesus going through Samaria, right? And he sat down at the well because he was what? He was tired, right? Uh, going on this journey, right? And, I mean, can you think of anything more human than that? He's going on this trip, and he's like, well, I got to sit down. I got to get some water, right? Well, the next thing that John talks about that's very human is that Jesus wept. By the way, it's the shortest verse in the Bible, right? That Jesus wept. And it's John who tells us that. So he talks about 
his deity, about how Christ equals God, but he brings in he's all man. He brings in he's all man. And the name of Jesus is pretty much used exclusively in the book of John. You'd think he'd use the, the name Christ, right? You'd think he'd use Christ in this gospel, right? Because of the deity of Christ and his resurrection, right? So why does he use the name Jesus? Because God became man. That's his name. Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus the Christ. So he uses that name over and over and over and over and over again. And so there is a mighty, mighty movement in this gospel, okay? And it's stated in John 16, 28. And I want you to remember this. This is the movement of what's happening in the gospel of John. He says, I came forth from the Father. This is Jesus speaking. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and I go to the Father. So, God became man. This is the simple statement of the sublime fact. And lastly, we learn in John 20 his whole purpose in writing the Gospel of John is John 20 and verse 31 that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. What a great memory verse, right? That you, personally, you, 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 me, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the living God, Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. You know, uh, MFM exists solely to teach women to come to know Jesus personally, passionately, powerfully, and preeminently over your life. So you just don't stop it personally. That's like what he's saying here. That you would believe, right? You come personally, but you move too passionately. You fall in love with him because you know him. And that word know, right? I want to know Christ, like in Philippians 3, my life verse. I want to know Christ is the word intercourse. And it means where I stop and he starts, you can't tell the difference. I want to know Christ. That's what he's talking about here, that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So you go from personally to passionately and then to powerfully because you know the Holy Spirit is the same, right? Same one that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, right? He that's in me is greater than he that's in the world, right? And then you go from powerfully to preeminently. He is my life. He's over everything. It's not that I'm balancing stuff. Are you kidding me? He's my life. Preeminently, he's over my thoughts, he's over my um, finances, he's over my kids, he's over my marriage, he's over the ministry, he's over your career, he's over your neighbors, he's over everything. He's preeminent. And that's life. And that's life through him. That's a quick little synopsis of what we're going to see in John, verse by verse by verse by verse, as we exegete it as we go through it. So I'm going to ask you to read um, John, just John 1 this next week. Just read John 1 uh, over and over and over again. We're going to really dig into that, the meaning of um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we're going to exegete means that you just go through um, and, and uh, explain the Word of God verse by verse, and then we respond to his living word, right? His word speaks, it's living and active, and then you and I respond to that word. We don't go like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, oh. Well, what do you think that means? What do you think that means? What do you think that means? Mm, 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 mm. No, 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 no. You will get in big, big trouble if you're doing that. This is the word of God, and we respond 
to his word, and then we're transformed from glory to glory to glory to glory. How great is that, right? How great is that? So let's pray, and we will close. Lord Jesus, thank you so, so much uh, that we are here and that we know you and that, uh, Lord, if there's someone that doesn't know you here, Lord, I'm asking that you would just come alongside them and uh, show yourself in ways that they have never, ever experienced before and that they would believe, that they would absolutely believe that you are Jesus the Christ and that they would have life in your name. And so, Jesus, thank you. Thank you that uh, we're able to... hmm, that we're able to walk out of here knowing you more and loving you more. And that we are light, and light pushes back darkness. And so bring us back, Lord God, next week again, ready to dig in, and thank you for the fellowship too, one with another. May may these women um, get to know each other well. May we come alongside one another, um, not just not just in in becoming more and more like you in your word, but also in fellowship with one another. And so, Jesus, we love you, and I praise your name. And everybody said? Amen, amen, amen. amen.